is built into the compounds. We've never really addressed that very much at all. No, we never have. Much more common. Okay, let's we'll we'll get going in the final session here. But well, actually, the next to final session, the last one, will be a discussion with members from each of the previous sessions, and we'll have a general discussion about putting the whole day together. But right now, I'd like to properly introduce uh, Lauren Fondal, who's the biosolids coordinator for the US EPA Region Nine, and been. You've been organizing these things ever since the beginning, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's that's a fair amount of time. I've only been doing it the last, what, five or 10 years, I guess. At least uh, 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is the 18th annual. So what her work, um, Lauren's work covers, um, you know, in region nine, Arizona, California, Hawaii, Nevada, and the Pacific Island territories and the tribal nations within those areas. Um, her tasks include tracking biosolids compliance by POTWs, other treatment facilities, and domestic septage facilities and land appliers, land application of class B. That's not required for composted, right? We don't track where it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As well as uh, compliance assistance and guidance on EPA's biosolids requirements and biosolids language in NPDES permits. She coordinates with uh, EPA headquarters and EPA's pathogen equivalency committee on interpretation of EPA's biosolid standards in 40 CFR 503. Thanks. Okay. So she's leading this next session on environmental justice issues. So I'll let you go from there. Okay, yeah, I'll just say um, I'm actually in the NPDES uh, permitting office um, at EPA Region 9. And in the last two years, environmental justice has become much more of a focus as part of the review of uh, draft permits and putting language into permits. We've been doing a lot more on on that uh, and you know assessing the environmental justice issues and it uh, most of this is uh, to date been focusing on issues associated with the treatment plan itself and the effluent and we really haven't gotten into uh, well are there issues uh, related to where the biosolids go because often biosolids from the coastal areas of um, California go into the Central Valley where there's a range of different environmental justice issues. So we have to look at that next. Um, our first speaker today is um, Andy Lisey of RMM Environmental Law Firm. And she assists and represents public agencies and citizens group on issues under CEQA and NEPA and the In Integrated Waste Management Act and other legislation related to land use matters. And she also teaches CEQA and other land use and environmental law continuing education classes. And so here's Andy. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks for hanging in there with us late in the afternoon. Um, so again, my name's Andy Lisi. I'm with Ramey Moose Manley. I've been there 23 years. It's amazing how fast it goes. Um, CEQA is our bread and butter, although we also um, deal with NEPA, other related planning and zoning law type issues as well. So I'm gonna touch briefly kind of just on, you know, what is, environmental justice according to the government code and how the state has defined it. And, um, whoops, sorry, I went too fast. <laughs> SB 115, um, this was, you know, the definition that's in the statute. Um, 
examples also including you know the availability of a healthy environment for all people uh, the deterrence reduction and elimination of pollution burdens for populations and communities experiencing adverse effects of that pollution so that the effects of the pollution are not disproportionately borne um, by those populations and communities and also government agencies that are engaging and providing technical assistance to populations and communities that are most impacted by pollution. So this, as you all probably know, is divided up between OPR, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, and Cal EPA. And we've had a lot of subsequent legislation since this time. Um, including AB 1553, which requires environmental justice elements in general plans for cities and counties now. Um, so relatedly, I could see someday maybe um, the integrated countywide integrated waste management plans may also in the future require consideration of environmental justice issues. And we also have, as of 2022, SB 535, which is Cal EPA's identification of disadvantaged communities, which at the end of my PowerPoint has a bunch of links. And one of them is to this um, Cal EPA identified areas, which is really helpful. You can toggle around different parts of the state to see like which areas have been identified as disadvantaged communities or not. Um, with that said, a lot of environmental justice advocates have a broader view of what environmental justice uh, means, including the right to live, work, and pray in an environment free from air and water pollution. Um, with respect to federal agencies, we have starting executive order with executive order 12 898, which was Bill Clinton's order from 1994. Um, some federal agencies began incorporating environmental justice into their NEPA documents. Um, and the courts have recognized that if um, federal agencies open the door, so to speak, and include such analyses, it may be subject to review by the courts under the Administrative Procedures Act. And that's, you know, irrespective of you know, executive orders not requiring your, you know, having a private cause of action or right of action or mandate to include such analyses. Um, a lot of agencies are doing so. Um, so there isn't yet any clear published federal decision yet on this issue, but um, I just brought a claim against the FAA under NEPA for the expansion of the Burbank Airport project. And we won, uh, it was challenging an environmental impact assess or statement. And you know, they didn't analyze noise, construction noise adequately. And part of the court's decision was, we'll go back FAA, redo your analysis, but also consider how that could affect environmental justice communities around Burbank Airport, because part of it was looking at construction noise impacts from truck trips, which are gonna be happening for three to five years at least during this very long construction period. Um, so they didn't, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal didn't quite reach that issue, um, but they did say, go back and reconsider it as part of your revised analysis. So, um, you know, with that said, CEQA does not yet require environmental justice analyses in CEQA documents. And I say not yet, just because there's been hints here and there um, from courts um, that it could plausibly be required or re at least reasonably arguable that it could be required in the future. But this, that CEQA does not require it now is based on the definition of what is a potentially significant impact on the environment under the statute. And then the environment is focused on physical conditions like air, water, noise, flora, fauna, um, and that the legislature has expressly you know, told the courts, you are not to read into CEQA procedural or substantive requirements that don't exist in the statute or the guidelines. Um, 
you know, with that said, again, we have some dicta from the fourth district court of appeal in the Golden Door Properties case uh, from 2020, which as I alluded to earlier, has this language about, you know, it is at least reasonably arguable that CEQA could require such analysis. So this case involved a challenge to the county's cap and trade or cap program, the climate action plan and a greenhouse gas mitigation adequacy regarding the purchase of offsets. And in that case, the trial court had found that the supplemental EIR did not adequately consider environmental justice because it made no attempt to disclose the increased health damage that could occur to the more vulnerable county residents um, from the project increasing non-attainment criteria pollutants and from not requiring GHG offsets to be obtained in the county. Um, unfortunately, the county on appeal didn't quite raise the issue right. They kind of put it in a footnote saying, well, it's obvious CEQA doesn't require environmental justice analyses. The Court of Appeal then didn't reach the issue on the merits um, because of that. So it included just this, this language here. So um, some agencies I think now are voluntarily including environmental justice in their analyses, at least you know, with the caveat that although CEQA doesn't require it in the interest of disclosure and furtherance of you know, public policy and dialogue interests or including this analysis um, because no one really wants to be the test case. And I know we did this in Kings County. I worked on the Cattleman Hill facility hazardous waste expansion project for like 10 years out of my life. Um, and that was part of the EIR's analyses. Um, so we included it with, with those caveats. And I think, you know, when you have public decision makers, they should be considering all the policy implications of approving a local land use project. Um, so that's my personal view. I know maybe some of my partners might disagree. Um, so, you know, this goes to really determining, you know, what, so OPR in the very beginning of a project, and I'm assuming like we're, look, we're looking at few, first, you know, lead agency approvals of either new facilities or expansions to existing facilities. So for bioresource anaerobic digestion projects, usually they're attached to like a wastewater treatment plant, as we heard earlier, or an existing transfer station MRF or, or landfill. So it's really important to identify in the initial instance, who's the lead agency, who are all of the responsible trustee agencies that are also gonna have to issue their permits or approvals, making sure that whatever environmental document is prepared covers all those bases. So that if you're coming forward as the applicant, for example, you're not having to go back and do additional review you know, at the responsible agency level per se, because maybe the lead agency didn't fully explain things. Uh, adequately. So OPR is really helpful in helping agencies and applicants, you know, identify who those uh, other um, agencies may be. I think in this instance, the more typical, um, you know, permits and approvals needed would be like a solid waste facility permit or a solid waste facility permit revision, uh, an authority to construct or permit to operate from the air districts, um, water discharge requirements or revised WDRs, and also countywide um, integrated waste management plan amendments, where you're identifying new facilities as part of the general plan documents um, that are required by every county um, for waste facilities. So it's important not to overlook um, who, is, who is involved. So I broke down my presentation just into like ways that environmental justice could be incorporated into the process. So obviously there's the procedural requirements and making sure that the notice of preparation, if you're preparing an environmental impact report or a mitigated negative declaration includes all the information that 
interested stakeholders may want to know about like what the scope of the project may be and weighing in at that early stage about what the issues sh should be that should be considered. I have a blurb in here about AB 52, which has to do with tribal cultural resources. Um, it may not be so applicable to anaerobic or aerobic type, you know, waste to energy projects, um, but I put this in there because if you do have a project that could implicate tribal cultural resources, there's this duty to provide notice to tribes that have requested notice in areas that are tribally and culturally significant. And then if they've requested notice of projects, you have to send that notice within a specific amount of time. And then if the tribe requests consultation, that consultation has to start before the environmental document can go public. So, you know, it's just something to be aware of. Um, and with AB 52, I, my interpretation is because it does not contemplate like addendums or subsequent or supplemental EIRs or things like that. It's really just in this initial instance. So if you have a subsequent environmental document, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily trigger AB 52 new consultation requirements. I think the theory being while you have a facility that's already there, a project that was previously approved, and that may have been why that was omitted. Um, so additional best practices in my experience to in incorporate notice into making sure you have community outreach is to translate public notices and executive summaries of your environmental documents into language you know, that's spoken by a majority if you have a disadvantaged community or um, people who like are predominantly Spanish speaking was the case in Kettleman. Um, so those notices were translated by our client, Chemical Waste Management, um, and mailed to all the PO box holders in Kettleman City. Uh, to also consider extending public review and comment periods, which is pretty routine, I found in my experience, uh, because a lot of nonprofits and people just don't have the resources and time. So sometimes communities need more time. And then if tribes are involved, to reach out directly to the tribes. You know, don't be afraid to pick up the phone if you're an agency and say, you know, would you like notice? and provide translation services at public hearings. So this, I wanted to spend just the majority of my last five minutes here on really the substantive, you know, potential areas to consider. Um, so, whoops, I think, oh, we're missing some slides here. Um, so yes, okay. So air quality, obviously, health risks are predominant concerns. Um, water quality, so di when you have digestate, um, what's the additional process for that? Is it going into the sewers? Is it going, you know, how is that gonna be handled? Um, contaminants have been issues in some of the projects I've worked on too in terms of compost and if you're putting that on land application as we heard in the earlier session what does that do for groundwater quality also noise and and hazards I've no, I've seen a couple of news blurbs about Europe having lightning strikes on some of these big um, facilities that um, you know, have methane in them and having big fires. And so, you know, if you have that next to a community, you have to be considering those sort of things in your environmental analyses too. Um, so this slide goes over mainly when you have, a, if you're the lead agency, um, you know, incorporating and being mindful of the geographic scope of your project area and the cumulative effects. So really explaining the basis for the geographical area that's been determined to be studied for each particular resource area. So in the FAA case I mentioned earlier, one of them was when they looked at the disadvantaged communities around the airport, they took this huge geographic area. And I think it was to dilute 
like how many people of color really were going to be infected around the main part of the project. So it was really interesting to look at it in that sense. Um, so then they say, well, no disparate impact, no environmental justice community impact, but it was like this huge area. Um, so that was curious. Um, also, your baseline conditions really have to be substantiated. So if there's existing operations, like existing truck trips, um, existing air emissions from whatever facility is there and operating, if there is one, um, so that you're looking at the delta of potential effects of the new proposed project from what is out there existing. And also, if you have an already degraded air basin, for example, the significance of emissions can be less than where it might be in an otherwise you know, really good air basin. Um, so the significance can vary with the environmental setting. And then, of course, health risk assessments is huge. In the Kettleman example, we had at least two, maybe three health risk assessments and then a peer review. I mean, granted, that was a much bigger project than what I think a lot of the projects at issue here involve. Um, but that was still you know, a huge area of concern of the community. And that's what ended up, I think, helping us really prevail in the court case that preceded that. Um, mitigation is also key, obviously, in, in EJ. Um, circumstances. What I've run into a lot is when you have responsible agencies that are acting after a lead agency, um, don't always realize that they can require changes to a project in order to lessen or avoid the effects of a, of a project, but that has to be within that area or that discretion of that agency. So sometimes we see agencies you know, wanting to impose additional conditions for like air emissions, but then that's the air quality management district's role. Uh, and, and as an applicant, you can get sometimes inconsistent conditions or inconsistent requirements, and um, that can be very frustrating. So, um, and also just, I just wanna to touch on and then I'll hand it over. Um, it's important to incorporate into the project designs, any self-mitigating type features. So for, for example, for organics processing anaerobic digesters at um, the Davis Street Transfer Station in San Leandro was one that I worked on for waste management. Um, you know, they have big automatic roll-up doors that go up and down quickly. They did a negative air system to control odors and emissions, spent a bunch on biofilters, um, things like that. So to the extent you're looking at, you know, siting issues and design issues early on, you might be able to save yourself a lot of heartache, you know, down the line um, if, if you're trying to anticipate concerns uh, in the future. And there'd be so much more to talk about, uh, but I'll save it for questions and I'll turn over the floor. Okay, and um, you want five five minutes for questions? Or, or if you want to. Or if you want to do it at the end. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and see uh, Jonaki. Jonaki here. There you are, yeah. Um, and um, see Jonaki is the Community Water Center's Director of Environmental Policy. And she has also worked for the California Rural League, Legal Assistance in Fresno in enforcing on uh, environmental justice and worker protection and assisted in the creation of the Community Alliance for Agroecology, which is based in Delano. And she's also a founding member of the California Farmer Justice Collaborative. So, Yeah, just a few too many hats, but thanks for getting them all, Lauren. Um, and thank you for having this space, for creating this space um, so regularly. I mean, it's a, it's a uh, historically for me has been a place where I've come to learn and over uh, the course of time has been a place where we've had some of the best discussions about how to move environmental justice, both within the development of compost infrastructure and as an outcome of the use of compost in our ecologies. And um, I'm thankful to have been preceded both 
by Andy and as well previously by um, Michael from CDFA because I am a soil scientist by training and an attorney, but I neither want to talk to you about science nor the law today. Um, I want to talk to you about organizing and I want to talk to you about the human infrastructure that it takes to drive the implementation of SB 1383 in our most disadvantaged communities in, in California. And um, I'll begin by reading you an obscure little passage from, uh, from a paper called Compost Politics, which I've returned to a whole lot um, over the last several years by uh, Sebastian Abrahamson and Filippo Bertoni, who wrote this paper about the analogs between composting and politics and um, where this picks up, they are commenting um, broadly about sort of the, the dilettante nature sometimes of how we talk about uh, intercommunalism or interspecies dependence in ecology and the way that compost in some ways uh, sets us away from that uh, simplistic attitude. From the focus on friendly companions to the attention to practices of care or living together, the notion of companion species and their entanglements with humans has been polarized towards a pleasant and nice version of coexistence. But dealing with composting, it becomes clear that relations with the environment are never so neat and clean. What are then the modes of being together with the dirty side of the green? What practices emerge at the mundane interstices of the big picture of a functional ecology, wasting, eating, rotting, consuming, transforming, and becoming with are brought together in a variety of ways in practices of composting with earthworms. Here they're talking about vermicomposting. Reporting on our own and others' attempts to live together with earthworms, this paper tracks the non-relations and asymmetries of the transformations of more than human materialities inside and outside domestic composting bins. We argued that the example of living together with dung earthworms sheds light on the interplays between attachment and detachment shifting the notion of conviviality from a green and comfortable democratic collective to a messy yet constantly productive and ongoing existence. Couldn't describe my politics any better than that. So I shared it with you because I've been stretching my arms in two directions between the often litigious world of environmental justice and that which I see as a future that's coming, that's underfoot uh, as we support the creation of a better economy that, that regenerates our soils, regenerates our, our agricultural landscapes. And I'm the director of community advocacy with Community Water Center. And um, what you see up here are water samples and a piece of pipe that gets carried around from hearing to hearing, oftentimes here at Cal EPA, um, to county offices, to community groups where what we understand is that over a million people in California lack access to safe and affordable drinking water, oftentimes because that water has been polluted by agriculture. It's just stuff has been put into the ground over the course of time that we now know um, has resulted in, <clears throat> in this outcome. And all of this is tied to compost. I can't say that everybody on my team really deeply understands the soil water nexus, but it's my personal uh, agenda to make sure that that nexus continues to reach uh, the front of, of all audiences, whether you know we're talking to community residents um, or we're talking to farmers or we're talking to government agencies. And our mission is to act as a catalyst for community water solutions through organizing education and advocacy in California. Our office is right across the street um, for ease of, of harassment of the state water board, just kidding. Uh, so right here is a uh, Cal Enviro screen. Has everybody here, who all has seen this map? And I, I can't see you on the computer, sorry. Oh, great, <laughs> awesome. I'm really hoping that most people have seen this because this is maybe uh, one of the best things that that's come out of Cal EPA in the last 10 years. It actually celebrates 10 years of its existence this year. And what this, uh, right, <laughs> right, Andy, yeah, uh, so this, the, what this is showing us is uh, a combined accumulative burden score, which it was the first time that um, I believe it's the first time a state agency did this, <clears throat> but it certainly was the precursor to the federal government doing something similar, whereby California was began collecting environmental hazard data. So things like 
uh, proximity to a hazardous waste site, groundwater contamination, local particulate matter, um, these sorts of environmental indicators, and set them alongside the human outcomes, right? Low birth weight, asthma rates, linguistic isolation, um, income. And created from this a combined burden score that results in what you see here, which is a reality that in uh, what, I mean, you probably can't see this, but this is the Bay Area. So what you are gonna see is um, obviously our, our wealthier coastal communities uh, in the dark green and Bayview Hunters Point uh, and the areas located nearby refineries in deep red. And of course, in the San Joaquin Valley, where I primarily work, the communities that are some of our biggest agricultural producers pumping out $40, $50 billion worth of agricultural product, also being home to the communities that deal with some of the worst uh, outcomes in terms of human development, lowest on the human development index uh, on par with parts of Appalachia. So we of course have to ask ourselves, you know, like why, how did it get like this and why does it stay like this? And I'm really glad, you know, to have been able, like I said, to have been preceded by folks who both defined environmental justice and also talked about um, some of the impacts to groundwater that and, and where they come from, specifically talking about nitrate. Um, but, you know, I wanted to show this map because in many ways it's tied uh, to California's climate agenda. This was created as an outcome of the passage of California's climate policy, AB 32. Um, as it was part of a subsequent law that was passed to ensure that climate solutions funding as a result of our cap and trade program, our, <clears throat> our uh, legacy cap and trade program that caps pollution a certain amount and brings it down yearly, creating uh, auction credits as a result of that system that are traded on the open market meant to create, make it a better business decision to pollute less, right? That, that revenue source should be going to turning some of these places that are red incrementally greener over time. And this is administered through many, 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 many different programs. But one of them is, is you know, putting funding into waste reduction, organic waste reduction, because as we understand, you know, methane being a short-lived climate pollutant and uh, being um, much more potent in terms of, of climate change uh, impact than CO2. So I just wanted to kind of attune people to some of the community issues that we deal with in the San Joaquin Valley. In the communities that I work with, I'll just go back here really quick, are right in, in the middle of this very red zone. And most of the places that I work with who don't have access to clean water are unincorporated communities. So these are not oftentimes big municipalities because our big municipalities tend to have the ability to do things like collect a bunch of taxes and then, you know, um, put together appropriate water infrastructure that's going to make sure that people don't wake up and they don't have anything coming out of their tap. Unfortunately, it's very poor, uh, small unincorporated areas. And these places don't come out of nowhere. They are agricultural settlements. They're places that have a very specific history in California. They arose at a time when uh, agriculture was blooming in, Calif in California and there was a big demand for things like peaches and plums and grapes and pomegranates that were being uh, sent to the East Coast through newly created refrigerate, refrigerated um, train cars. And who was gonna pick all of that stuff? Really ended up being waves of migrants and specifically um, a lot of people who came during the Dust Bowl who had you know, white migrants who had the economic wherewithal and the social standing to be able to create um, these modern day settlements that are now contaminated with nitrate in their wells and deal with overhead aerial pesticide application and are dealing with these, these environmental justice outcomes. So I just listed out here some of the things that these people deal with. Uh, it's a lack of access to water. It's a lack of access to housing. Um, personal health and disease transmission issues are extremely high here, and we saw that uh, uh, particularly during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, places of employment are limited to agriculture, packing and processing. A kind of interesting thing is as you go to some of these places, you'll see that they're anchored by a packing house the way a church anchors a town in 
Mexico or South America, they're a place where it's surrounded by um, orchards. So obviously this was an economic center of those areas. And maybe more importantly, the lack of governance being unincorporated communities. So uh, the Dust Bowl was um, maybe the last time that we humbly took a look down at our feet and looked at soil as a resource that needs to be cared for. And I would argue that now is the next moment that we are now with the recognition and the revival, the renaissance around regenerative agriculture. I mean, if anybody remembers during the um, 20, gosh, 2016, 2017 election, what year? Did the election happen during the during the during the democratic uh, debates? There was like this discussion, these discussions around regenerative agriculture, and everybody at home was like, you know, feverishly googling like, what is what is that? All of a sudden, presidential candidates were talking about it. Um, so it's been only in the last you know uh, five ten years that we started to see this enter the the zeitgeist, and it's a uh, truly my hope that as an outgrowth of the implementation of 1383, that we start to see those impacts around the distribution and access to compost incrementally uh, start to meet the needs of environmental justice communities. And it's a long process. And I don't mean to say that this has been figured out, like, far from it, you know, this is, these are questions that are continuing to be asked and answered. And it's really um, lovely to hear about like recent studies around the, the actual implementation of the healthy soils program and how that's gone to uh, allow us to to quantify the water holding capacity improvements and the ability to chelate nitrate and to kind of ensure that you know those impacts of compost are quantified because that too is nascent that's very recent that we're actually able to uh, to look at that beyond simply doing what I've been doing for the last 10 years and taking two jars of soil, one that's a low organic matter and one that's high organic matter in front of a group of people and pouring water over them and saying, well, I don't have the science guys, but you can look and see what the impact of compost is uh, potentially on an aquifer. So I wanted to give you some examples here around um, how, you know, in the, in the vein of compost politics, some of the ways that uh, compost is being used towards the end of environmental justice in the San Joaquin Valley. And I'm gonna try to keep this really short so that we have time for questions. <clears throat> Here's one example of a Healthy Soils funding recipient in the uh, town of Lindsay, which is in Tulare County near Visalia. And this is a community farm called Quaker Oaks Farm. It's also home to the Quaker Friends Meeting House. They were some of the first and uh, most ardent sustainable agriculturalists in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, and it's also a parcel that's shared with the Wok Chimney tribe for the native people of Tulare County. And um, through a, a agreement there, the uh, farm is also being operated by uh, Wok Chimney family members. So a part of it is a separate entity called Wok Chimney Farm. Um, here's another community actually uh, that we work with in Monterey County, surrounded by conventional farming. In this community, there's five or six times the legal limit of nitrate in people's drinking water sources, but right in the middle is a farmer, uh, Javier Zamora, who's also a Healthy Soils uh, recipient and is somebody who applies compost and utilizes some ancestral practices, such as uh, the planting of marigolds and beans as a way to uh, battle root knot nematode and also um, bring a organic soil fertility regimen to his farm. You can see how lovely his soil is there on the right. And that's my staff there in his hoop house. And then we also deal with the kind of like messy inequity that a lot of these farmers who really should be accessing compost are small leasers who don't actually own their land. They're people who are doing the important work of improving their soils and potentially long-term improving their aquifer, but who will eventually have to leave that land and will not be able to ever own it. And there's one such person, a lemongrass grower <clears throat> in the community of Del Rey named Jimmy. And all around this community are pomegranate fields and 
the town is contending with a 123 trichloropropane, um, an, an old fumigant pesticide byproduct that is, um, has caused a compliance issue for the drinking water in that community. He's using peanuts and compost as a part of his organic soil fertility regimen there. And lastly, on the very micro scale is the uh, community gardens, of course, and this is the Arvin Community Garden, also another community that we work with, <clears throat> who through a community benefit agreement are obtaining compost from the Recology facility. And um, this, they also produce their own compost on site. So these are just some of the ways um, that we are seeing compost be used and the thought process around the connection to soil being transformed uh, little by little and the use of state dollars going uh, to, to that end. <laughs> Pardon me, I'm losing my voice. I've been talking all week. So um, I will actually just stop here because I don't wanna take up all the time that we would use for questions, but happy to share these slides. And here I made a few recommendations. First around um, municipalities that are not exempt under the population exemptions for 1383. And then secondly, for those that are, most of the communities I work with are indeed exempt uh, due to the population requirements. Thank you very much. Do we have questions in house? Yeah. You're short. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> it wants to fall off. Um, there's often a dichotomy between um, sort of a, a facility like anaerobic digestion or, or composting in, in that it falls under a waste category, waste land use category. And so when it comes to um, citing that type of facility, there's a lot of actually environmental justice outcry or nimbyism that occurs um, no matter how much you might uh, explain the, the benefits or the best management practices for the odor, the noise, the hazards, the air emissions. Um, I was just wondering from either of you, how you guys navigate that dichotomy, especially in community outreach. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, and I'll, t I'll take first crack in that um, for those who have been a part of the Association of Compost Producers for a while may remember that in um, 2016 or 17, uh, I was a part of a project with Dan and, and what at the time was a agroecology working group of the Association of Compost Producers to create a document that actually outlined some of those best communication practices between industrial scale compost facilities and environmental ju justice groups. And what I did was interview five EJ communities and five corresponding large scale facilities. And the point was to have them sit together and connect and create a, a space whereby that initial um, kind of calcified feeling that there's an industrial group entering my community could be slightly eroded through that softening of that relationship up front realizing the magic of compost, right? And the need for compost and the ability for it to heal. So um, I can't say, it would, the, the point of it was for that to be actually like adopted by Calvary Cycle into some of their um, uh, best management practices for facilities. And I think that process got mothballed because the EJ division here, at least Calvary Cycle's EJ group was run by volunteers, um, but it's something we still have and uh, it's something that's been thought about and I'm happy to share those recommendations. Yeah, I would only add to, I mean, like Janaki was saying, I think it comes to education and the more you know, the less fearful projects become to people. And the Davis Street transfer station was an interesting one because there we were actually sued 
by people in Alameda County who thought, well, if you are taking green waste and organics and you're source separating, you know, those from a mixed stream and making compost and, you know, people are no longer going to source separate and you shouldn't have this kind of facility. So it was kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of being sued for, you know, fears of contamination and things like that, where, then, and I learned it was like a, you know, deep dive for me and the learning about all these processes and the environmental documents from the city from 2011 that were relied on by the task force and also to amend the countywide integrated waste <laughs> management plan didn't do like the greatest job of explaining everything. So I guess engaging in the fiction that people read these documents, <laughs> um, but you know, having a, just a educational initial, you know, meeting and then a consistent uh, project description throughout all of the approvals is really key. Questions from the. Questions. <clears throat> Here we go. It seems that almost everything we talk about here are the mitigations to impact. We're trying to do resource recovery. We're trying to better the management of waste. And as such, it's an improvement arguably whatever the project is, is an improvement over what the baseline was in most cases, it's arguable, that whatever was going on wasn't as productive, as clean, as functional as what is being proposed. And yet I've never found a place to where you can put your foot down on that in sequel. It's really difficult even on, a, on an air basin side to say, well, we're taking out three of these and we're putting in one of these to do the same thing cleaner. You can't, there's not a, are you finding that there's a, a responsiveness uh, within the process to projects in and of themselves that are the mitigation to what was there before? So I think what you're touching on is like this life, life cycle analyses. And certainly when you're permitting a new facility in the very beginning and you're going through an environmental impact report or statement if you have federal money at issue. Um, you know, that's why these documents are becoming so voluminous is explaining what the basis is for that and looking at, well, where is your material going before this happens? How many truck trips were occurring? Uh, yes, you're bringing in maybe heavier loads, but those loads are gonna be fewer truck trips um, because you're then, you know, going through the anaerobic digestion process. And so I guess to answer your question short, yes, I, I think that that analysis is happening, but it's always, if you have opposition, never good enough. And again, I think it's, it's incumbent on agencies to look at you know, what's already been done? Is it project specific? Has there already been environmental review for that particular site that you can build on and explain how it's going to improve the environmental conditions? Or is there like a programmatic statewide document? I know back in 2011, Cal Recycle did a programmatic EIR for anaerobic digestion facilities. And can you build from that or incorporate by reference those analyses that you know, has already been part of a certified EIR and supports the assumptions that, you know, through some of these projects, environmental conditions will improve. Um, so just looking at all the tools in the CEQA toolbox. Is that our general uh, LQ days and uh, Andy? One other thing I would wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> While I have my soapbox, um, for anybody who's like in the building or has influence in the building, I think it's incumbent that we really think about potentially exemptions for some of these projects. And we can do exemptions from CEQA for, you know, Inglewood football stadiums. Well, is this not as important? Um, you know, if, if you have a project that maybe meets a certain particular size, 
is in an area not surrounded by disadvantaged communities, for example, you know, if, if you could set up a framework and criteria that says, okay, check the box, check the box, like we do for infill housing projects and things like that, then maybe you don't have to go through environmental review. That would be nice, especially considering like the carbon cowboy said earlier today, you know, we need f <laughs> the 50 to 100 new facilities that we need in order to implement 1383. Well, okay, how are we going to get there? And let's look at like, what are the low hanging fruit and not let CEQA be the impediment? <laughs> well, go ahead and stay here. If Can you guys stay a little bit longer? Because I want to call up uh, members from the previous, uh, or is that Kara, thank you. And um, Michael, can you come up? That'd be great. So um, what we've tried to do in previous, um, um, everybody has access to mics. So who we have up here, we're, we're keeping the CEQA and EJ professionals here. And, um, and then Kara has said that she would be willing to uh, be part of this and our friendly, uh, Carbon Cowboy will said he'll be back. He's on a, another thing, and he said he might be here as soon as a quarter after, so he can join. And then, um, and then Michael from from CDFA. So we've got a good representation of the legal profession, the uh, NGO profession, <laughs> you know, and Johnicky, Cal Recycle, and uh, CDFA. So. I've jotted down through the day uh, a number of um, kind of questions, and we try to organize this whole symposium to reflect on different aspects and uh, facets of this very complex industry that we all find ourselves in together. Um, and um, so we, we, we talked for first, in the first session, it was about the progress of uh, SB 1383. And I don't think there's any better promoter or cheerleader than, <laughs> uh, than Kara. So, and, um, and then we talked about low carbon energy and we'll hopefully get um, one of the biggest apologists for that, uh, Edgar, to, to join us. Um, Evan Edgar, and um, and then we we also talked about healthy soils and compost. So it was a good build to have Janaki, um, you know, take the implementation of how we go about CEQA without doing CEQA directly, and um, and we had this discussion over lunch too because Michael here has been one of the organizers, Michael Taru of 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 the symposium in years past and, and has all already spent a lot of his life producing projects that never came to fruition. And I'm, I've, there's, you know, in the last 40 years that I've been in the industry, that's been the case. There's just many more projects that don't come to fruition than those that do. And some that do come to fruition flame out for all kinds of different reasons. So we're trying to develop an industry here and, um, and we, I think we can and we should celebrate our successes. Sometimes I just wanna go to solving the problems. Um, and, and I think we have a good cross section here from all of today's panels. Um, I think I kind of want to open the floor for other people's questions. I've got a list of things that are that I find important. Can I yeah. start with? Yeah, I don't please. even know if it's my question, but I loved listening to Andy. And it, it just makes me think that the what? I loved listening to the previous session. Right. And I think that um and talking about that it's, you know, it's the um it's not this building, but it's that building over there, the big white building, right? Okay. And yeah, I think, you know, for for the, um, for Cork or what are, you know, the compost industry to think about when it comes to um, this notion of what 
what changes could we make to CEQA for projects that, and I can't remember some of the examples that you, you listed, infill housing projects. And some of these projects that don't require this huge CEQA. And I just think there's an, there, the time might be right for, you know, maybe a legislator who would want to run some legislation like that. But I think it would take the compost industry kind of putting together what that looks like and what projects we're talking about so that, you know, legislation. So I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on that, but that really got me excited. Like, I think there's an opportunity here and it's not a, you know, it's not something that we as a state agency, but it's the stakeholders, the compost industry that could move something like that. So I don't, do you have any more thoughts on that? Only that when 1383 was coming forward and my friend Scott Smithline from law school was at the helm and I just remember thinking, Scott, how are we going to get there? Like, this is great and all, but you know what? And I think honestly, if you had an existing say wastewater treatment plant, and then you're putting anaerobic digestion there. And if it's under say 400 tons per day or whatever the threshold is, I'm just throwing it out there. And you only have, you know, you're not increasing truck trips or maybe you are, but only by a certain amount. And it's, you know, not in a residential surrounded community, mm -hmm. just similar to like what we have for infill housing of five acres or less, whatever the acreage might be. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, it, you're not impacting wetlands and other, you know, yeah. resources. Mm -hmm. So something like that, that it could at least fast track like I said, some of the low hanging fruit where we get more of these facilities online faster. Yeah. And, you know, it's not necessarily always, what was it, the six years and a hundred million for this anaerobic digester in Paris to be permanent and built. And actually I was thinking six years isn't that long, you know, really <laughs> in California for a brand new huge facility, that's pretty good, but that's really sad that that's like my jaded frame of reference having done CEQA for 23 years. Um, but yeah, so that it's not really well formulated. I don't purport, but it's my little wish list. So yeah, and I, happy I, to work I think on it's something, something like to that. start thinking about and formulate. I think there's a real opportunity. And I also appreciated what you both shared on community engagement and some of those best management practices. And I think that is the second, my second item, um, that I think we should really, um, get out there to the industry because I think when you do community engagement in the right way, it it has, and there's so many benefits to it. I mean, it, it creates a positive, more positive situation for the community. And it also, um, you know, I think uh, reduces some of those barriers that projects face where community members, you know, I remember in Anaheim where the community, you know, considered the investal digestion system a bomb and got the project killed. And, and um, maybe there was, maybe there was, if there had been the right kind of community engagement, maybe it wouldn't have ended in that way. Maybe it would have anyways, but at least doing community engagement in the right way. And I think being able to provide the industry some of those really strong best management practices that, that you shared in your presentation and, and you know, the things, the way that John Key shares um, about the, the benefits of this, I think could be better communicated. So I just wanted to throw those two things out there that got me really, really jazzed. Definitely. And I think um, I have so much I want to say about this, but I want to keep it on the panel here. Um, we did, Janaki, when she was doing her um, work with us, gosh, has it already been, what, five years ago or something? Um, yeah, it was yesterday. Um, we have that guidebook and Cal Recycle wanted to pick up on it, but then there was a management change and these other things. I think what this tells me is that collaboration isn't easy, whether it's in Washington or whether it's international or whether it's down at the county level, which is most of our work happens between properties of whether they're renters or whether they're owners of that property and the impact of that property ownership on their own families, but also on the adjacent families. And that's one of the things that we learned from Recology, which was one of the 
uh, you know, they, they acquired the community recycling facility where two undocumented employees died from carbon monoxide poisoning. So that kind of ruined their business as well as had a big shock on the community. Oops, go ahead. yeah. Say that again. That was Crown Disposal, not Recology. Yeah, before the one who owned that one. That's right. And Recology took it over, and that's that became kind of a guiding principle in in our guidebook to environmental justice for composters. That's we still have that paper. We haven't really brought it out yet, and I think that's one of the things our association is trying to do now that we have 1383. We don't need to be in here working with Howard Levinson and Scott, you know, before, you know, putting together those regs. And I think that was a big collaborative process. And now that we have it and we'll, we'll start tomorrow's morning with uh, 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 an update on the procurement piece, which we lobbied hard for. And now that we got it, it's like, oh, shoot. Now, how do we work with communities? so that they want to buy back and use their own compost. And a lot of them, you know, and so we'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow morning, but um, one of the other conflicts that I saw today and that still remains in the industry is that our compost community isn't working necessarily with the energy, the bioenergy community, but, um, Evan is doing it in, in their consultancy, they're doing it. And you're, you've been on the board of, of um, the, BAC. the BAC, yeah. And, um, and your brother is on the board of the National Compost Association and heads up the, you know, that's Neil who's not here, but he might be listening in. Um, so I think there's that collaboration at that level here in Sacramento and I've, Never been a Sacramento wonk. I'm not a politico, and uh, and yet, but I've been on a lot of local task forces, and so right now, after um, Will Box's untimely death, and who was one of the founders of the CCC, um, we're reinstituting the local, uh, Son you know, compost coalition of Sonoma County. But that's really different than what was going on in San Diego or what's going on in Riverside or even what's going on in East Bay. And, and so how do we as composters support, mm -hmm. as well as energy, bioenergy producers, support that development? And I think, I think it's right here in the environmental justice and the CEQA process, but it is about collaboration. So I think, you know, yeah. Yeah, my um, last slide of the presentation was about zero heroes, right. about how we work CEQA with <clears throat> metrics and real information, not just a bunch of hype and misinformation, but actually we do the math. As part of the math, every um, there's a greenhouse gas component of CEQA, and we do a net zero greenhouse gas analysis. So every facility I work on, we're already net zero greenhouse gases, and we bring that to the table, and there's a um, fungible carbon credits through the California Pollution and Control Officers that you can actually trade secret credits someday. So, so we're net zero greenhouse gases as part of every EIR and as we reach out to the community. Plus we make, when we do make bioenergy or fluids, we're carbon negative. We're off diesel, our trucks are near zero NOx. So as we take our refuse trucks through the community, we're already off diesel, dirty diesel, done dirt, cheap to a landfill. We don't do that. But in a mindset of the environmental justice community, they picture us as dirty diesel, done dirt cheap to direct all the landfill. We don't do that. We actually have um, carbon negative fuel. We make it ourselves and we use it in our trucks. Our trucks are near zero NOx, not diesel. And so all the trucks we have in the community as you go up and down the streets are near zero NOx and carbon negative fuel. And we're doing this now. It's not a handbook. It's something we've been doing for a long time. And we show that in CEQA and we show that to the community as part of our Outreach, and then of course we um, have organic compost. We're off pesticides and fertilizers, and we do that, and we have regenerative agriculture, and we bundle that up in a community benefit agreement. Now, Recology did pioneer that in Kern County with regards to have a host fees and a lot of good and community engagement. And then where I'm at, in a lot of the last grant cycle, we have huge community benefit agreements 
that you get 10 extra bonus points. But on top of that, we um, use that money to feed hungry people with edible food recovery. We um, have education and training in the community. So this is something we've been doing for a while. It's not something we want to do or talk about, but for the last 10 years, that's what we do. And we translate that into CEQA. We have community benefit agreements to uh, with AB 617 communities. We do all that. And with all that still, you'd be surprised how they think that some of these facilities are ticking time bombs or or this um, big oil or big waste or something. And we're, and we're community scale. We don't go big, we go home. We go home in a community. So that's why I'm confused working with environmental justice. I go to every environmental justice advisory committee at CARB for the last um, AB 30 scoping plan for the last 15 years. I'm an EJAC stakeholder. And I try to explain it to them. And eventually this last round, we got some good feedback with regards to the natural working lands, how um, EJAC is supporting life cycle analysis for fertilizers and pesticides. And we do that too. So regenerative agriculture. Um, environmental justice has stepped up a, along the way with what we're doing. And we translating that to them. And still it's lost in translation, no matter how hard we work at it with the metrics as part of CEQA. But in a lot of my recent EIRs, we have no opposition for large scale um, community, like within Tillery County, for Tillery County. Not a problem there. Merced, we had a uh, county had a notice of preparation, no pushback. And these are co located at county landfills down in Shaft or Wasco. Um, they have a, a gore system down there, they just got fully permitted, no pushback. And, and then we did outreach. So in a valley where we co located at landfills, and the, it's size for the community, for the county, it's not importing a bunch of stuff from LA. Um, we are getting some good results by telling this story. So I think we made good headway. Even at Yolo County, we got um, we got a uh, we did uh, Compassville Yolo County, and we got that permitted. I started that in '91. It took me 30 years to be operational, but I don't quit. Yeah. So um, I'm I'm wondering. Well, I think a lot of it has to do too, in my view, with how much. I hate to call it education, although that's one of our strongest uh, committees. I think it has to do with information, but also engagement, like like you were saying, um, community engagement. I think we were talking about that. And um, so it's kind of learned by doing, because we, you know, one of the biggest takeaways from a lot of our last meetings over the, last, you know, our annual meetings and the seminar that you you joined us uh, with just a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, where contamination is a big issue. And that's, you know, Caltrans was saying that contamination is still a big issue. And, you know, so we're talking about people putting the right stuff in the right bin, and that's the decision point. Uh, and there's a lot of confusion around that. But then when you come around and and say, well, you've got to do, uh, I think another member of your panel was talking about, um, you know, the contamination reduction, you know, people, then material, and then uh, the utilization of it. So I think there's something here with all of our minds and intentions. I don't, uh, how do you see now working with the, wa the waste industry or the recycling industry or like we were calling it agroecology. How do you see, yeah, Donaghy. Thank you, Andy. Um, so the, the work that we collaborated on uh, around this kind of roadmap for siting of uh, industrial facilities, composting facilities came at a time when there was a lot of naivete around how long it was going to take to meet this 50 to uh, 200 facility goal that was uh, put forward back in 2016. And um, that there was a, it, we had an urgency about it uh, to create this, uh, to develop those relationships now in order to preempt these uh, potential litigation or just the the general butting of heads that happens when there's a, a new facility that comes to town. Um, and the, the reason that I, as an as somebody who like comes from the environmental justice movement as an attorney in that world, chose that 
chose to, to engage in that work is that compost is something different. It's not your average technology. It's actually not really a technology. Many members of ACP have said it's a poop to dirt industry. And it's a reason why we, we struggle to create value in it is because it's something deeply understandable to everybody. If you just think about it for a little while. Um, and I think education around compost is something that uh, I've engaged with, with low income communities of color, all the way from folks who are illiterate, all the way to, you know, talking about it to people at the highest levels of government in California with the same educational tools because of, of the understandability around it. So my posture around it hasn't changed that, uh, and I don't necessarily wanna conflate anaerobic co-digestion or digestion of any sort, um, which can carry with it, uh, you know, connotations that are associated with more technologically advanced forms of industry that have deep histories of violence in the San Joaquin Valley. And to, to think of just kind of jumping in and having it be an overnight transformation of those connotations is, it, it it's misplaced. Um, even 10, 30 years of doing that kind of work is a, is a tiny speck on the larger historical trajectory that has resulted in those environmental disparities that I just presented about. So we've got yet another several decades ahead of us of those discussions to be had in order to heal those, um, th those positions that community members take. But with composting, um, I think one, ex one of the kind of maybe most psychologically offensive examples of a composting facility is um, Tulare Lake Compost in Kettleman City, which is one of the uh, several composting facilities that composts portions of Los Angeles County's human waste. And it's also located in Kettleman City, a, a premier environmental justice community in California, a, a proverbial cancer alley. And um, I was able to take groups of environmental justice uh, advocates and local community residents from Kettleman City out there because of the open attitude that that facility has of saying, please come to our facility and check it out. We know it sounds kind of gross, but just come in and, and take a tour and you'll realize that, you know, we're using all this sort of state of the art mitigation and we'll show you our stacks. We'll show you everything that, that we have to show. And you can take some compost home if you dare. <laughs> and uh, that, that cultivation of deep, of real friendship is at the foundation of, of compost politics, really moving through these uh, messy interstices. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to share one of my, my stories when I first got into the industry, which was also in just south of there in Kern County. And I went there and there was a citizen group that was, you know, at the time lobbying very heavily and it eventually went to court. And um, of you know keep keep biosolids out of out of Kern County and we have experienced the same thing in Tulare County as well as what you you know said in Kettleman City and there was this one little eight by eleven poster where it showed this old guy coming out of the outhouse pulling up his pants and um, and flies around his head and stuff and on his shirt it said. LA and on the outhouse that said Kern County. Oh. And so the caption was don't let Kern County be the outhouse of LA. So it was automatically the citizens were pitting the city folk against the, um, against the farming folk. And at the same time, um, the farmers, that's their marketplace, not only LA, but way beyond LA. So, you know, I'm become much more sensitive to that. It was just, sharing with uh, one of my new friends who's in, uh, Michael over there, Cohen, who's um, with UC Cooperative Extension, and they've just formed a new organic specialist position for five county areas in, in, in the Bay Area, and he's representing those um, in, you know, from Santa Clara County. But um, yeah, so, um, and I've been studying a lot of this ever since we did that project and have run across a group uh, out, of, out of New York, but they also have local offices called prosocial.world. 
and looking at how, and they talk about the eight core design principles of common pool resource management. And all those eight common principles, which I'm not gonna talk about it at this conference, but I definitely wanna bring that forward next year through, through our distributed support of municipalities. Right now, the biggest municipality that's hardest for all of our composters to support is where I grew up, which was County of LA. You know, that's a quarter of the state's population right there. But fortunately, you know, LA composters and community composters is another way to bring the local community into this. Yeah. Exactly where I was gonna go with was kiss, kiss the ground. We highly supportive Cow Recycle putting grants out for community compost for 5 million this year that was gonna not be funded. And, but we thought it was important to fund that and we were able to give up our funding at, at the infrastructure large scale if it needed, but they did fund it. And what we're seeing at the last U.S. Composting Council in Ontario is that's the next generation of composters or the community composters that are coming up and even having a little larger um, um, regulation on that in order to develop the next talent and to get people excited. So community compost is, is huge and for environmental justice and for the community and for the clean green stuff and, uh, and for the, and for the food stuff. And the second big thing is new is the regional hubs for carbon farming. The healthy soils initiative is a great program. And there's a paper out on carbon farming for clean green only, no food or biosolids out there. But we're working with the ranchers and we compost on the farm. And these got these re regional hubs for carbon farming are huge. So in this distributed compost, I'd rather go small and, and distributed and community scale than go these big, large facilities because the bigger they are, the harder they fall. So right. keep it keep it distributed, keep it local, keep it clean and green, and keep it um, and community compost is a great way to um, parlay into the next generation. I agree, and there is that new association that was helped to be supported by Cal, Cal Recycle, I believe, and that's the California Alliance with Community Composters. dot org, the CAC dot org, yeah. And um, right now we are looking to team with them. We also have started up that a t more of a teaming relationship with uh, soilhub.org, which is what you were referring to, the RCDs statewide. So I think there's there's a thousand points of light here, potentially. Can to... I ask for a point of clarification? Yes. Yeah. I would ask for a point of clarification on people's thinking. Uh, Evan, when you're talking about preferring small scale um, facilities, uh, more than half of the population of California lives in what you could call Southern California. Only 10% of the farmland is located there. Um, and it seems to me from my few trips to Los Angeles uh, that you can't cover that population with a few uh, widely scattered small-scale facilities. There have to be some large, uh, large-scale solutions in terms of the flux uh, uh, of uh, resources going through, but also an accompanying um, transportation solution, uh, especially, I mean, put bluntly, you could aim to make all agriculture in Southern California organic and use up a lot of that compost, but otherwise we're talking about a tremendous transportation issue. So I always wonder what the, um, uh, what the shipping or the transportation challenge looks like to you. It, it is a long-term one. Well, we do it all. Community compost is to get the, the people involved to scale up later to move on to um, larger facilities. So community compost won't solve the issue, but it the part of the community engagement that compost is good and people are feeling it in their community, but it won't by no means take care of the supply out there. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree. But it gets gets everybody involved in the community to have and kiss the ground and all those um, and all the um, stuff that comes out of there is unbelievable public relations, very positive. But yeah, you definitely need commercial scale to take care of the lift for 1383, you need 1500 facilities. So I do that more so, but I think we need to start small and engage the next generation at the community level to be successful at the larger scale. And VMTs are big. That's why I have a map up there about compost in a valley and most of the AD is on the coast because on um, the coast can afford it. 
Um, it's higher ex it's expensive, more land, higher labor, but you make um, RNG and digestate on the coast and then you lose that volume to haul it out to the valley. So you got less of a haul, then you backhaul the compost for, for procurement back to the urban sector. So VMTs are big, but, um, but the amount of carbon on transportation is, is incremental, like 5% of what you'd get for the carbon offsets for not taking that food waste to the landfill. So having the incremental transportation emissions, especially if you're using near zero NOx with RNG fuel on class eight trucks, which we want to continue doing, then you have a lot less NOx and, lot, and you have carbon negative fuel. So you don't have that type of transportation emissions when you have the right transportation structure. Zevs won't do that on payload in the four tons of batteries cuts back on four tons of compost. So we can't afford to haul that batteries around. We want to haul compost, organic compost to organic ag for regenerative purposes. Well, yeah, and you bring up a good point because you you, know, you made it in your talk about the circular economy. I've been, I've been talking about that ever since I was teaching it in high school, but that was, you know, I was in my twenties and thirties then. But, so, and, and, and the, the economy that you're envisioning with the, all of your work and, and, and all of that is, um, it's not just a simple circle. It's much more network, just like you were saying, between advantaged communities versus disadvantaged communities and helping people to grow genuine wealth in whatever community they're born into or migrate into. So, um, and I, you know, I brought up the idea that we at our LTF, the local task force in Sonoma County, I said, have we ever talked to the Economic Development Board, which is in the, count, the same county? Have they talked about circular economy? Have they talked about how do we develop our community in a just way? That conversation needs to be had. That, that's another collaboration, I think. And um, so, and, and sometimes we call it education but maybe it's marketing and branding, or maybe it's just getting to know your neighbor, you know? So, yeah. Any other thoughts or comments about the future here? I was just um, gonna add on to the urban infrastructure issue. I mean, that is something I now live in Long Beach area. I've lived in Sacramento for many years, but you know, the infrastructure of, of getting the bio gas to energy is something that, you know, like transmission of electricity, we just need to work on and invest in, in the state. And there is such a huge need for RNG still in communities. Um, you know, so to the extent that, you know, there's not like one solution fits all right, obviously. Um, but I just, was thinking back to like the old Bradley Sun Valley landfill. It was one of the first landfill gas to energy projects where it just gets piped right into the grid. So, you know, if we have opportunities to do that instead of trucking material really far distances, although that is part of, you know, what we got to figure out, um, but it has to come from a variety of different, um, you know, solutions, so. Well, and part of it too, it has to do with this procurement because there were a couple projects going on. I mean, the only city that I know of that actually has a healthy soil strategy is city of LA from their uh, department. I was on that panel and it's a few years ago now, but I haven't seen it being implemented. It's like, oh yeah, we got this strategy. Now what? Um, the other technology that I'm personally trying to bring into California, because I'm only half time with the association and half time with my own consultancy, is a, contain, is a containerized technology, an in-vessel technology that's made with reconditioned shipping containers. So for every compost static pile containers, you have one biofilter and you actually have more if you're gonna do, create a new category of product called biofertilizer. So I think there's a lot of, we're at a tipping point in terms of both the technology, but also the economic development of multiple cycles, because we talked about the water cycle and that's, you know, kind of shifted from compost to water, but the two are so connected. Since 90% of our water in the state is used, put on soil first to grow things. And then the other water comes on the state on, on you know, the erosion control and stormwater management. And that's another big project that actually was put on the books, but not 
ever invested in in California, in LA County, uh, which is uh, was done by Cal Poly Pomona and one of the landscape architects in um, in LA San. Um, you know, they got hundreds, if not a few thousand engineers in there. And they had one landscape architect. And she's already since retired, but she had this project where you, would, instead of, you know, for flood control, channelizing, you know, all of the stormwater into the, the so-called rivers, which, you know, I grew up around there and a lot of movies have been shot around there. But they had proposed a way to have the water go where it normally goes, which is in, in the, you know, the, it goes, it fans out, which is why it caused a lot of floods and as well as the lakes. So they were saying, use the stormwater system uh, to store little amounts of water all over the city so that the disadvantaged communities now have rainwater that lasts all year. So it's kind of like the monsoon in India. I don't know if you've ever been there and seen their big collection basins. So they collect all that water when it's rainy and then live on it the rest of the year. Well, we don't have that. Yeah, we don't have that infrastructure, but that's part of putting the water infrastructure together with the soil infrastructure, along with the waste infrastructure, and then of course the energy infrastructure, which um, has been talked about here today a lot. Um, anyway, I think there's a lot of hope, but it requires this kind of collaboration, it seems. And we didn't really choose you, just because we all thought you were on the same political page, but <laughs> but it seems like that. So, right, we do have one question from online, um, and it kind of tries to tie in some of the challenges we've talked about with some of the uh, tiers of economies of scale uh, that we've also talked about. So, this is a uh, specific to kind of. Um, jobs and uh, centers of waste generation. Uh, so this person says, on the issue of reducing contamination or organic waste, uh, I wonder why we're not creating a new class of jobs whose role it is to source separate waste at high volume centers like malls and large cafeterias, airports. And uh, I recently went to Calgary, Alberta in Canada, and they have a, a specific people whose role it is to take your food tray and sort out the waste properly. Um, we can see this probably in all of our lives, all of us being cognizant people, we probably <laughs> have encountered endless waste bins that are just not correctly used. Um, so uh, restaurants and food courts uh, being a central source of plates, cups, trays, and washed by other staff and et cetera. So just wanted, they, this person wanted to bring up that idea and see its role potentially in people's name? Uh, anonymous attendee. Okay. Yep. So yeah, feel free to jump comment or uh, do any of you have comments on that? Well, you know, we're just starting and um, the local assistance team is just starting to learn more about valet services, which is kind of that mode. And we're seeing it um, being primarily practiced in like multifamily kind of dwellings. And so I think there is some opportunity and I think potentially there might be some growth in that area because I think it does make a lot of sense and can be really helpful. So, um, yeah. So that's at least what I'm familiar with in California. If I could vent a little bit with a less professional tone, <laughs> it, it, in a sense, it's it, it, it's too bad we ha to have this conversation at the state level because it is partly a federal uh, level problem. Um, how things, how different products are labeled. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, I live in Davis and, and even in Davis, depending on which uh, Starbucks or Pete's or whatever business you go to, it is utterly unclear which products should go in which bin, even for the most conscientious people. And, uh, and, and, and that also extends to the way that the products themselves are labeled. And, and, and it's the fact that uh, many people, even for myself, it's sometimes hard to distinguish whether a particular paper product really should be acceptably put into the organic uh, matter bin. And there's no clear explanation of all of this uh, and, and no standardization of it. And so I don't think we should underestimate, pe underestimate people's capacity to get with the program if there was a program. Yeah, good point. Uh, I worked uh, on the board of an uh, entrepreneur in Pasadena 
who had the Pasadena Rose Bowl account. She's since uh, lost it because there was a change in management and they said, yeah, waste management is not part of our business here. And, um, and yet she was bringing in, you know, the community college, the high schools, you know, with the education at an event. So I think the focus on that middle market of on-site composting with events where you also have landscapes where you can use the product, which they did, they had a golf course and, you know, the rose bed, uh, gardens and so forth. But now she's pivoted and working with, you know, what a, we call a category of institutional composters, basically large landscapes like college campuses, um, you know, any any campus for that matter. So, yeah, and it goes usually goes with gardening programs as well as landscape programs. Yeah, yeah I think just to add to, to Michael's point, I think the effort around implementing SB 54 yeah. and, you know, the, the packaging initiative, I think that's another huge paradigm shift that we're going to be going um, through to help address, um, to help address what you're bringing up because it's a real issue. It's like, no does this go in recycling? Does this go in the green bit? Like, where does this go? And some of these products are being designed so they really can't go anywhere and they should. And so I think I'm very excited. I wish, you know, 54 would start tomorrow but it's gonna take time for it to be implemented. But I do think building the circular economy around packaging, um, I think we're, we're really starting to make that shift when it comes to organic yeah. waste. And, and But I think that's the next, next big horizon. And I think Just you're absolutely plug, right. Tomorrow morning, Ben Allen is going to speak with us about SB 54. What was his intention and how is it getting implemented? Um, composting is not the panacea for packaging. What it's, is? Composting is not the panacea for packaging. We're not the new China. We don't want that stuff. We stop greenwashing. I'm channeling Neil Edgar here because he's on, on his SB 54. We draw the line yeah. on bullshit marketing from biodegradability to all these waves on pack. We don't want that stuff. Yeah. It ruins our um, CDFA um, labeling. Omri, um, they want to dump on us. We don't want it. We want to preserve our quality and contamination. So we're strong on um, SB 1335, which was um, serviceware for state facilities to draw the line on bamboo and fiber-based products. We don't want any of that stuff. So, so when SB 54 is there, we do not want all that stuff coming to our compost facility. Some bulk composters who are maybe larger and corporate who have bulk compost and mix it all up and it's dirty MRFs and dirty politics and dirty dancing. We don't do that. We will keep it clean and we want to make sure greenwashing stops with SB 54. Yeah, I think that one last thing I'll say on that, I think that's really important. And I think that, um, I think Andy might've said it, we need a whole suite of technologies and approaches to manage our waste stream. Mm -hmm. And it's not just going to be composting, but I think there are many, um, diverse approaches to manage our, our stream. And that, you know, that, that includes biomass facilities that produce hydrogen for fuel and we build out our hydrogen infrastructure. And so I think that's a big aspect of this, that there's a lot of dirty organics, right? That shouldn't go in compost, but they could go to hydrogen production. And so I think the more we can look at that, that we need to look at this in a, a suite of approaches um, to deal with our waste. But the important point is we can no longer see it as a waste, that we need to think of these things as feedstocks and the circularity is so vitally critical to our communities, to our state, to our planet. And that's where we have to move to. And and I, I believe we're going there and we're, we're doing it and making it I happen. I agree. And that's why I love your positivity. Okay. I just want to. I guess I just want uh, to we on. have to be out of this room by five. Is that true? There, there's no uh, aggressive timeline there. And, um... I was just going to add on. Yeah. You know, living in Orange County now, it's just this other paradigm where like the laws just don't apply to us. And so I finally bought my little mill machine because I've only gotten one little 
you know, postcard in the mail saying, hey, there's this bill, SB 1383. And then nothing ever since, like nothing is being done in my little jurisdiction. So I got my little mill machine and I'm excited. It's finally coming. Um, so I can at least do my little part in the kitchen, <laughs> but it goes into becoming chicken feed, you know, supposedly. So that's interesting. Um, well, actually, I happen to know about Orange County because they're um, public waste, their waste manager, he's, he's general manager of that. They're putting in three big compost facilities, one at each of the three landfills. And they're not really engaging the public yet. And that's one of the reasons we wanted them to support our association so that we can do more of that with the other associations like CRRA where, um, and um, like the community composters. And, uh, and so we're actually collaborating on International Compost Awareness Week with Neil uh, and Cork. Cork is the technical council of CRRA. So I think at the association level, we can coordinate our state programs, but all of that has to happen at the county level, like you're saying. And you know, the county will sometimes ha handle it or the waste managers who work with them, you know, like the Vertex and the Edcos of the world down in Southern California, you know, their slogan is we will, we'll take care of it. But well, I think it comes to enforcement too, right? So that's right. Like my little city is Seal Beach. Like it's just, there's no hammer from the state. So they just don't do anything. Everything just goes in the garbage. Yeah, it's a both end for sure. You know, so... It has to come from enforcement as well. And so I have a one little follow-up kind of gimmicky uh, response from the person who asked the previous question okay. and said that AI cameras and monitors uh, uh, can be allowed to like, you hold up a piece of waste and it tells you what bin to kind of put it in kind of like this identifier yeah. thing, which could be kind of engaging fun game playing, you know, for people in waste, especially in large volume areas that we discussed earlier. And the other thing, me personally, what I've noticed is uh, when you look at kind of a society that's built around um, conscientiousness, um, it's it's hard to find an example that's more conscientious in this arena than Japan for the societal expectation of carrying your own trash and sorting it and, and them having, you know, uh, that whole thing. And, and they're still, I would say, off the mark of where I would like any society to be. And if that's the best we can get human beings societally wise, like there, we probably have to get even more creative and more like onerous and more everything than even what Japan has yeah. done. You know, it's, it's I like a human compatible AI. That's the title of a book, by the way. And, and gamifying, which is what my son and I often talk about because he's really into computer games. And, um, but it's, it's a human process too, you know, let's have fun with it. And I think we're all here to do that. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, really appreciate. Good first day. We'll see you back here bright and early at 9 a.m. Thank you. See you next time. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's just fun to watch your evolution. Yeah. And and along. It's a co-evolutionary yeah. process because you've taught me so What's much. You a lot of work. You know, oh. Just by oh. working oh. in right. your yeah. orientation and everything. Lobbying to get the metrics. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. So I wasn't. I wasn't wrong with my statement today. No, no, no. I okay. heard it. I heard it. You were yeah. fine. You were okay, fine. I don't good. know where you got such a precise number as eleven point three, but that it is about that. <laughs> you know people. All right. I, I got to go to catch a train. Yeah, good to yeah.